Hello, my name is Stefan Bauer and I am working at the PTB in the Josephson Group. Today I want to show you how we combined an AC quantum hall device with our four terminal pair impedance bridge which is based on pulse driven Josephson arrays. I hope you will enjoy this talk and now let us start. To give you a short outlook of my talk I will start with the motivation and then introduce the JAWS 4 terminal pair impedance bridge. After that, I will show you two QHR samples which we used for our measurements before giving you the first results of the measurements. Finally, I will conclude and give you an outlook. The motivation of our work is to make very precise impedance measurements for the dissemination of electrical units. We want to simplify and automate these measurements by use of digital impedance bridges. When we now use a Josephson voltage standard as a stable and precise voltage definition for our impedance bridge and combine this with a quantum Hall resistance as a universal impedance standard, we get a very reliable and precise system. If we now make use of graphene for the quantum Hall devices, we can also get relaxed experimental conditions, like we can raise the temperature to liquid helium temperature and lower the magnetic field to a couple of Tesla. Moreover, we get the opportunity for a mutual investigation of the samples and the impedance bridge. So, for example, we can investigate the AC properties of our quantum Hall device by using our four terminal pair impedance bridge. Let me now show you a very simplified model of our four terminal pair impedance bridge. As I already told you, the potential definition is made by Josephson voltage standards. The measurement current is applied here by two independent but synchronized current sources. And if we now apply the potential and currents correct in amplitude and phase, we achieve that the detector reads zero and then the impedance ratio is directly given by the ratio of the applied voltages. If you have more interest in recent developments of Joseph's impedance bridge, I can kindly recommend you to read the recent work of Frederick Aubenet and colleagues. Let me introduce to you now the Josephson Arbitrary Waveform Synthesizer, which was invented by Sam Benz and colleagues at NIST. This system offers a high spectral purity, infinite stability and high resolution, since it's based on a quantum standard. In the left plot here, I show you the frequency spectra of four different waveforms we generated, and you can see that in all cases, the difference between the fundamental tone and the highest harmonic is more than 110 dBc. This is already the limit of our spectrum analyzer. To obtain two independent voltages, we split our chip into halves with one array on each side and close every loop as much as possible. And afterwards, we will cover this part with a metal cap also to minimize the crosstalk between both signals. And by that, we achieve a crosstalk of about 146 dB at 100 kilohertz. And if we go lower in frequency, for example, 10 kilohertz, this crosstalk is already below our detection limit of about minus 180 dB. The phase change in our system can be arranged by changing the starting position of the second memory with respect to the first memory. So this is our pulse pattern generator, which offers two memories. And the signal we generate here is fed via the high frequency line to our Josephson system which is cooled down by a pulse tube cryo cooler. This schematic here is the extension of our existing two terminal pair impedance bridge to a four terminal pair definition. As I said, the potential definition is made by Josephson voltage standards, but now for the four terminal pair definition, we add current sources to our four terminal pair impedances. This current is provided by the outputs of two lock-in amplifiers, and to fulfill our defining condition that the potential lines are free of current, we detect the current in the inner conductor of the potential high line. And we adjust the current injection in the way that we minimize this reading. Thanks to the triple series connection of the quantum Hall device, there's no need for a Kelvin balance anymore because the triple series connection already achieved that this line here is free of current. And of course, we have cable corrections also for this type of connection. We have in green marked the cable correction, which are four terminal pair definition corrections, and the magenta lines are the cable corrections for the triple series connection. 
The first graphene-based quantum Hall device I like to show you is kindly provided by NIST. The design is made in a multiple series connection even in each contact, as you may say here. So it's not only an external triple series connection, but all these contacts are made of different branches to have these multiple series connection already realized on the chip. The devices are doped by chromium tricarbonyl, and this method offers us that we can change the carrier density even after manufacturing them. And this is done by annealing them at a temperature of about 140 degrees Celsius. And if you want to change the carrier density in the other direction, you have to expose them again to air and wait a while. And after that, you can reheat them to the wanted carrier density. This plot shows you an overview measurement of the sample. And you see that at a field of about five Tesla, the quantum Hall value is reached and the longitudinal resistance vanishes. If you are interested more in these type of quantum Hall devices, I will recommend you the talk of Matthias Kruskopf. And for even further details, I can also recommend you the paper of Matthias Kruskopf and colleagues, which is recently published. At PTB, we are also producing graphene-based quantum Hall devices, and we are also involved in the graphene impedance quantum standard project, which is a European metrology project. The contact design of our samples is quite similar to that of the NIST samples. But in contrast to the NIST samples, we dope now the samples with F4 TCNQ. That means that the carrier density will be fixed during fabrication. And if you take a look to this overview plot, you see that also for this sample, the quantized state at DC is achieved at fields above 5 Tesla. Before coming to our first measurements, I'd like to show you our four terminal pair impedance standards. Here we have two 10 nanofarad capacitors, one 10 kilo ohm resistor, and one 12K9 resistor. All of these standards are arranged in a two-stage thermostat, which is stabilized to the millikelvin range. The first measurement we did was to measure how much noise we will pick up from the surrounding or how much noise we will see in our setup. And for that, we do an LN deviation plot, which is plotted in nanovolt at the Y scale. And at the X scale, you see the measurement time in seconds. The black data here is recorded with our lock-in amplifier, and a fit to this data is shown in blue. The red curve just shows you the theoretical expected noise value by just taking into account the input noise of the preamplifier and the Johnson noise of the quantum hall running at 4 Kelvin. You can see from this plot that our minimal type A uncertainty will be in the range of 2 nanofarad per farad. Typically, we measure 100 seconds, and this get, gives us a type A uncertainty of 3 nanofarad per farad. One very important measurement for AC quantum Hall devices is the sweep of magnetic field. We also perform these measurements, but against the regular procedure, we have not measured against a room temperature resistor or a thermostatted resistor, but against a 10 nanofarad capacitor. This has the great advantage of having low noise, and this halves our measurement time. And this is a useful measurement to characterize devices. You can see in this plot, I plotted the relative deviation from the quantum Hall DC value over the magnetic field. In this plot, I show four different carrier density settings of the NIST sample. And as you may see, that also the carrier density will influence the shape of the magnetic field response of the quantum Hall device. The same measurement we have made also for the PTB sample. This time the sample is P-doped and you see a quite similar behavior, but this time at the different field sign. Unfortunately, all our measurements do not show precisely the middle or the both sides of a plateau. We can just look at the first part of the plateau and therefore we cannot be sure that 12 Tesla, the maximum field, already reaches the middle of the plateau. So you have to keep this in mind for all upcoming measurements I present here. Since the quantum Hall devices are new devices which we do not know the properties of, we made the calibration the other way around. We are not obtaining our 10 nanofarad capacitance value from the quantum Hall value, but vice versa. So we took a freshly calibrated 10 nanofarad capacitor and measured the quantum Hall value at AC. We made these measurements again for different carrier densities, as you can see from these 
different background colors here. And you see again the relative deviation from the quantized Hall value over the measurement time. You can see in blue the measurements are marked with capacitor C1 and in red with capacitor C2. All mean values are marked with these stars in the corresponding color. You see that at the beginning we just had some warm up of ourselves to get familiar with the balance procedure and all the equipment. And then you can see that at different carrier density we obtain quite close results for both capacitor, which is expected. The very last setting of the carrier density shows a higher spread. This could rather be due to we lowered the carrier density even further, or what I guess is that this was the first time I changed the carrier density and I was not so familiar with this procedure and just trained it. And maybe if Matthias had done this, it would be much nicer results. Nevertheless, we see slight results between both capacitors. They are quite small. They are only 2 to 44 ppb. We also performed measurements with a resistance standard and we are interested in the stability of our resistance. The first measurement again was to make an L deviation and you can see here the L deviation in nanovolt over the measurement time and again the black measured data fits perfectly the theoretical expected value. This time for the input noise of the preamplifier and the Johnson noise of the QHR at 4 Kelvin plus the junction noise of the 12K9 reference resistance standard at the thermostatic temperature. To get a history of our device, we also ask our colleagues with the CCC to measure the time drift of our device, as you can see here. So it's the deviation from the quantum Hall value over time measured with the CCC. And now we try to measure also the time drift with our four terminal pair impedance bridge at AC. This is shown now here in red. You can see that the slope is within the arrow bars exactly the same. So this is the first good outcome of our system that we can make reproducible measurements to find the same time drift of the, our reference resistance like the CCC group does. You can see also that we have still a slight deviation between the CCC data a DC and our AC measurement, even though we correct the frequency response of our reference resistance. Again, this deviation is small, but we want to, to shrink this more. Maybe we have a different frequency correction for our standard, which has to be remeasured again, or there's some systematic in our system which we have to find. We made further measurements with our resistance standard. This time we were interested in the frequency response of the quantum hall device. Again, all values are referenced to the 10 nanofarad capacitance measurements at our reference frequency. This plot here shows you the deviation from the quantum Hall value of our reference resistance over the measured frequency. And to explain our data, we use a very simple model that the resistance change is equal to the DC value of the resistance plus a term linear and frequency for the quantum Hall and a linear term for the reference resistor. And further, we had also a quadratic term, which is correlated to our cable corrections. Now, since we know almost all of the components, we can just subtract the DC value of the reference resistance. We can subtract the linear frequency dependence of our reference resistance. And we can also subtract the cable corrections, which we have measured. And then we should came up with the frequency response of the quantum Hall device. And if we do so, you see this plot Again, the change of the reference resistance over the frequency is shown, or in this case, it should be the change of the resistance value of the quantum Hall device. And normally you expect a linear drift. Unfortunately, we have not seen this. And this could be due to many reasons. So for example, this new quantum Hall device could have a quadratic dependence on frequency. Then also the bridge balancing procedure could not be optimized and we have to recheck this again. And the last point is the cable corrections. The drawback of the system we used to test is that it's not optimized for AC measurements. So the rather long cables in that system has also very high impedance. So the cable capacitance is quite high. We have almost one nanofarad per connecting cable. So 
this is not ideal for AC measurements. Let me summarize. I hope that I can demonstrate to you a compact and simple design of a four terminal paired jaws and pedance bridge combined with an AC quantum hall device. I showed you a measurement made with two different graphene samples and that we can reproduce the time dependent drift of our resistance standard quite well in comparison to the CCC result. Unfortunately, the cryostat cabling was not optimized for AC measurements this time. But we have a new setup which is designed for doing AC measurement and this is ready to test. Nevertheless, the four terminal pair bridge was a very useful tool to investigate the new graphene devices. To give you an outlook what we will go on, for sure we want to test new samples and investigate our bridge further. So the first thing is we want to test the ACT08 header developed by Jan Kuchera from the Czech Metrology Institute. And we want to install them into our new system, which is based on a seven Tesla magnet immersed in liquid helium. And with this system, we can cool down two samples at once. So we have one header for the TO8 system and one of the Euromed system. And here I have to thank Frederick Aubigny for his support to make this even easier than the previous version. And this is what it's looked like if we close all, both of our caps. And now we can just immerse this sample stick into liquid helium, which holds our seven Tesla cryomagnet. And if we can start this measurement, we want to fully evaluate our system at different frequencies and also automate this to have a very compact and reliable four terminal pair impedance measurement with an AC quantum hall. Of course, I haven't done all the work on my own. I would first like to thank Grant Almquist and the NIST group for providing us such nice graphene samples. Further, I'd like to thank Oliver Kieler and the Quantum Electronics Group for supporting us with Joseph's and Voltage Standards. Finally, I want to thank the whole Quantum Metrology Group, which raises good questions. I have a lot of fruitful discussion with them, and they make calibration and support me wherever they can. So thank you all for the great support. So now I would like to thank you for watching, and I hope that we see us next time. Have a nice day.